right. Let uh, all of our attendees enter the room. Uh, welcome everyone to Powerhouse Arena's virtual events. My name is Chris, and I'm very pleased to be hosting the launch for Alice Knott by Blake Butler. Grab the book right here. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. You'll be able to ask questions uh, through the Q&A function on your screen. Uh, and you can also buy the book at powerhousebookstores.com. I'll uh, post it in the chat and the link is also on the event page. It'll be 10% off for a limited time. Uh, Blake will be in conversation with Chelsea Hodson and I'll introduce them now. Chelsea Hodson is the author of the book of essays, Tonight I'm Someone Else, and the chat book, Pity the Animal. She teaches at Bennington College and she co-founded the Mores Tua Vita Maya Workshop in Sezza Romano, Italy. And she has been awarded fellowships from McDowell Colony and Penn Center USA Emerging Voices. Blake Butler is the author of five book links book length works of fiction, including 300 Million, Sky Saw, There Is No Year, Scorch Atlas, and Ever, as well as the non-fictional Nothing, A Portrait of Insomnia. I'll hand it over now. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Powerhouse, for having us. Um, I'm excited to talk to Blake. I really love this book, Alice Knott. I've been telling everyone about it, to read it, and Thanks to everyone who's joining us tonight. Um, I just think it's gonna be fun to kind of chat with Blake and pick his brain about stuff and writing and this book. So um, Blake, did you wanna start by reading just a couple pages from the book before we jump in? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank, and thank you, Chelsea. And thank you, Powerhouse, for letting me be on your internet with you. Um, I haven't read from this book ever. I don't think I've ever Read it in front of anyone, so I don't know what what cool. part to read. <laughs> I'll just read this. I'll, I think I'm gonna read uh, four pages from. So the premise going on is that there's like um, um, a vi a video is released of someone destroying a famous painting, a de Kooning painting, um, and uh, after it's released, they start to th the 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 what the person that owned the painting is Alice Knight. Um, uh, I'm not going to give any other backstory other than this is the second video. They end up releasing another video after that. Uh, it's just kind of a video released online. So this is the second video that comes out of art being destroyed. Well, actually, this isn't the video itself. This is the public's response to the video once it comes out. You, don't, you won't see the video, but um, yeah, you'll get it. <clears throat> the virtual reach of the second destruction video surpasses the previous in record time shared and reshared an insane pro pro proliferation across all platforms left to sprawl. And, it's, and in its renewed wake comes a further propagation of publicly destructive acts, however connected or unconnected in their adherent mania as reported by the sets of talking heads behind the glass. Within hours, for instance, a collection of 18 paintings by the classical French Baroque master Nicolas Poussin, 1590, 94 to 1665 is noted missing from their temporarily from their temporary display in the hall of napoleon under the pyramid at the louvre where once again no alarms had been triggered in the process nor is any evidence of tampering evident beyond the removal of the work itself including the same blanked out security footage of the area within the time of the occurrence just as in alice's home robbery the total take it must be incessantly repeated remains literally invaluable with various official estimates assessing the net worth lost around 2.2 billion. And perhaps more, even as we speak, says one pundit, as now the price is going up. Everybody wants their own piece of Poussin now. He's the absolute hottest. The museum security provider, an entity as highly reputable as the one hired by Alice, is placed under investigation, as are all current employees of the facilities, rendering all public access for the time being on hold. In other words, as the unpopular news anchor puts it, the museum will be indefinitely closed. Rumors about potential international sabotage given the entity's alleged dire financial status, as well as more outlandish conspiracies regarding, conspiracies regarding the questionable authenticity of the museum's collection begin to circulate. Never so beyond possibility that even those most in the know find their dreams haunted, their sleep devoid of rest, the night alive. 
Who else is out here among the world with us, we wonder, studying our behaviors, keeping their masks clean, biding time? Everyone at once, so all on edge, we sleep with automatic weapons, bark at our loved ones over parking, have another drink, another drink. It's business as usual, really, and business is booming. It's what we were born for, to partake and to respond, to find our voice among the rest. Meanwhile, even nature's in on the prank now, up to its neck in human drift, as in masses, tree all, trees all over the world begin drooping from out of nowhere, their roots discovered stunted, rung with worms, flocks of disoriented birds disrupt a major air traffic control center, interrupting long enough to lose two jumbo flights en route to a major vacation destination, killing dozens. Their blood will sink into the seas. It will wash up in swaths of gray foam with massive schools of fishes already rotting as they cover the white sands of a calm shore. A child not yet old enough to know a language, awestruck by their fetid color as she hangs strapped to her mother's chest during their morning walk, searching for shells. The first memory she will remember having all these years later. After all, it is our memories we want. More than expression even, more than information. Please leave me be with what was mine. Meanwhile, overseas, the feed reports the Center Pompidou in Paris, a screen displaying at, at the Center Pompidou in Paris, a screen displaying an early print of Kenneth Anger's Lucifer Rising is head butted by a 14 year old, shattering the glass and causing profuse bleeding from his face. The family's legal representation will later sue the museum for emotional and physical damage, eventually resulting in an out of court settlement. Versions of the video remain available online. Now who's watching? Hours later at the State Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, a young man dressed in all blue takes a pocket lighter to the face of the angel in Albrecht Durer's The Dream of the Doctor, scorching the skin of the face of the image, directly mimicking the original viral video before being tackled by a local bystander. The culprit during his arrest will reveal tattoos marking the flesh over his lush shoulder blade of what appears to be an illustration of the sun exploding and underneath the point of impact an inscription. I'll just show the inscription and then I'll stop reading. That's it, stupid. That, oh, sorry, that's not, that's the inscription. <laughs> yeah, you can see it. Thanks, that was great. How did it feel to read from it <laughs> for the first it time? Felt, it felt funny. It's just a voice I've heard in my head. So now it's out in my mouth and my mouth feels less. Yeah. Than the, than the other. Do you, ever, do you ever read aloud just to yourself? Or is that really the first time you've read it like aloud aloud? Mm. That's a good question. I think I read it sometimes out loud. I, I, t I tend to read in my head more than out loud because I don't like, I don't want my inflection and my voice and my accent to change the sentences. I don't want it to be my voice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, more people joined in the midst of you reading. So I just want to welcome everyone and remind everyone at the bottom of your uh, window in Zoom, there's a Q&A button. So um, we'll be open to your Q and A's. Um, I'm gonna ask a few questions, but maybe around like 7.30 or so, I'll check, I'll start checking the Q and A's. Um, so if you have questions along the way, feel free to enter them there and I'll be reading them to Blake. So, um, but first I wanna start Blake. I really liked your interview in The Believer today with Shane Jones. I thought that was a really great interview. Um, and you wrote, uh, you mentioned that the, that the idea for Alice not possibly came from a note that you wrote to yourself in 2006 uh, that said corporation that buys and destroys art like that was a note you had written to yourself and I'm just curious could you expand maybe on how the idea for the book came, like grew from there you know this like little note that you write to yourself so long ago how does that end up you know in Alice not in 2020 like how do we end end up here after a note that's that short yeah that's um it's funny, I didn't remember that I'd, I I found the note looking back through, I think it was in a draft email that I like to send emails to myself with ideas. So I think I found a draft of the email just saying corporation that buys art and destroys it, which I didn't remember <laughs> being the idea that I had been working on for all that time. I found it like a couple months ago after everything was done. So um, wow. yeah, so I don't know why. I think, the, well, the original draft of this book was like, um, a lot more chaotic and a lot more there's this is like two of the storylines that were in the book that originally had more like 30 I was just trying to like make an idea machine or something and um then I realized it was too much there was like there was just so many different storylines and they and they like sort of wrapped around each other in certain ways but I felt that I needed to pare it down if I wanted to be um if I wanted one angle of the story to 
be more clear uh, or for the story to have a full body rather than have many bodies. So mm -hmm. I wanted to kind of pare my approach down for once. Um, yeah, so then I wrote, so I wrote a draft of the book that was that with large bunch of ideas. And then I, once I realized I needed to pare it down, I rewrote just with that idea. Um, and, and with uh, a different main character, um, the, the main character was male and uh, was, is kind of abducted by the corporation. And it's just a lot more of a conspiracy theory type thing. And I didn't want that to be real either. So then when I realized uh, that Al, I realized Alice just, I started writing a different way. And that was, I found the voice, I found that I wanted the character to be more of the center than the idea of the art because the art, mm -hmm. the idea of the art being destroyed, being this, the idea for a book didn't feel like it could carry a book and it, it needed some kind of opinion. Right, needs something else to drive it maybe. And that kind of, um, that brings me to another question I had of how did it feel writing from a female, female perspective? I know that you were really drawn to works of art or films that are kind of led by a female main character, female perspective. You know, did you encounter difficulty with that or did it just come naturally once you decided that the book should be guided through a character rather than the art yeah um well a lot of the care i guess i realized at some point that my mom was influencing the book um the character alice has some memory or uh, i guess uh memory diseases are more rampant in this universe uh it's uh and i've been around a lot of memory diseases lately so um I borrowed a lot of my mom's way of seeming. I also thought about um, um, the actress Isabel Huppert. Uh, she's kind of who I imagine the character as, and it just kind of appeared that way, I think. Um, I feel more comfortable writing from a female perspective, which is weird. I've always just kind of naturally, when I start writing, I think that the narrators are female. But in this case, uh, I mean, it, it was important to me in the beginning pages that the, that the painting that's erased is the painting of a woman. I think I wrote, the that the de Kooning woman three painting um being erased and that before i had the character um it seemed oh, wow. important that it was a, a woman or being erased by by what's going on around her rather than a, than me or a man yeah it's interesting to hear how different elements of the book came before others like they seem so i don't know neat and tidy in the book where it's like oh of course that leads to that but when the way you're describing that makes a lot of sense for the character's development um, and then I wanted to bring up something that I actually learned from you. I, t I took a lit reactor class from you a couple years ago. Um, in one of your lessons, you introduced the idea of framing and constraints in fiction, something I know you're really fond of. Um, and here's a little quote from what you wrote for the lesson. You wrote, for some people, traditionally, a frame might be drawing out a plot diagram of a book, which they then use to know exactly what to do from chapter to chapter, page to page. For me, this plot-centered process is nothing but smothering. It defeats the ability of magic, of the unknown, of not knowing where you are going until you get there and are yourself are surprised by where the language took you. So I really love this idea of embracing the unknown in writing um, and allowing for magic to exist within a book. Would you say the unknown is what excites you about writing, that you don't know where you're going? Um, and how do you apply certain rules or constraints to guide your language further into that territory? You know, it's like, if it's a, it's a fine line in my experience between like, you know, applying certain rules and structures to what you're working on and having it all planned out. So I, I like to be in the middle too. And that's why I took that class from you. And I'm just kind of curious to hear you speak more on that, especially in regards to Alice Knott. Hmm. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I, I on one hand, I just said I had to write the book three times to get to one book, which so it's, I end up looking back and saying, like, <laughs> this is not an efficient process, but, but the, <laughs> it, it never is for me, right? for me either. Yeah, right, never. right. It's never efficient. Even I mean, like, I've tried to sit down and write all the scenes of a thing before I write it. And I'm just like, well, now it's already done. I don't, there's no magic to me in that. Uh, I don't like I don't like plot being predictive of, of language. I'd rather language mm -hmm. be predictive of plot because then you can do mm -hmm. things that it's easier to innovate storytelling if you're innovating from language rather than story. I mean, every, that's an old trope too, where it's like all the stories come down to man versus nature or man versus man or blah, blah, blah. It's like, not if you use language that tells something that none of those things correspond to. And so um, to me, yeah, it's, I, I guess when I sit down to write, I, I often don't, I might have an idea like corporation destroys art, but when I start typing a scene, it's like, well, 
where I, I think of the entry point and I think of where I may be trying to get, but I don't know how I'm going to get there. And that's the fun, I think. And that, and it does take trial and error, but um, yeah, I'd rather, I'd rather wander and try to figure it out and then just have to cut a bunch of stuff and to, till, till I write the thing that I was surprised myself by. Cause I've always, one thing I've always stuck to is that if I'm not surprising myself as a, while I'm doing it, then I'm probably not going to surprise the reader. Um, and I, yeah. I think surprise is an important element to keeping things interesting. So, yeah, definitely. And you know, even what you said about you wrote it, you wrote this note to yourself, but you didn't even really have it in mind throughout the writing process. It just shows to me that maybe you're just in touch with, you know, ac accessing your subconscious in a certain way, you know, of like things are just percolating in there, but you're not like, okay, now that I have this note, that's what the book is going to be. It's like the, that idea just lives in you maybe. And that's how it comes out. So that's kind of yeah. interesting. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. And I also think that like, even though you can have a sort of larger arc, you can, there, I like digressions and I like when things like the uh, trail off into details that didn't seem pertinent, like in the part I just read where it's kind of giving details about characters that um, it, it's almost like the ideas are bleeding and, um, and letting resonances happen that don't culminate in plot, but it kind of just, I, I think that the, a universe in a book is more interesting than a lot, like a lot of times the interest, the universe of a book is more interesting than, than the book itself. And I like trying to bring the book itself up to the language of the universe by letting the universe have all these holes and, and, and edges that don't necessarily lend themselves to the story that's being told. Um, Cause yeah. that's how life feels to me. I mean, you know, it's like, how, to, to think that there's a story contained in doing anything like walking from here to that tree. Um, you could tell it a hundred thousand ways and some of them are more interesting than others or something. <laughs> <laughs> or they, or you have to write it three times in order to get to the interesting version, right? Like what you're yeah. saying about writing three books to get one book. It's, I don't know, I, in my opinion, in talking to other writers, it, the mo the least efficient way always has the most interesting results, in my opinion. I think like as writers, we're always like, well, maybe my next book, I'll get it. I'll get like my process. And yeah, I think maybe we just don't, or we shouldn't maybe, like because then it loses that element of uncertainty or something. But anyway, I digress. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I get what you're saying. I do. I, every time I'm like, this time I'm going to I'm going to be normal. I'm going to I'm going to sit down <laughs> and write a story that goes from here to here. And it's going to be I mean, there's plenty of beautiful books that do that and plenty of beautiful writing that does that. But it's just like my brain doesn't want that. My brain and my heart kind of like get in the way over and over again. And so that's who's that's what's telling the story more than me, I think. So I just try to I try to get out of my own way and let things happen. Yeah. No, every day I wake up and think this time I'm going to be normal. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. every book every day yeah. <laughs> um, and okay so we've talked a little bit about the book as an object and this kind of like the big picture idea um but I'm really actually curious to hear you speak about how you approach writing and editing at the sentence level um because I do, this is just something that I really really love about your work but especially in this book these gorgeous often like really long sentences I actually began thinking about them as like winding staircases that would like lead me to somewhere totally different than where I started. So they took on this really kind of visceral visual quality for me that I don't really find in a lot of writing, especially contemporary writing. And um, it just gave the book this really disorienting effect um, that I feel like comes across most um, frequently for me in film. But it, so it has this kind of cinematic disorienting quality that I just thought was great. So even when I was like, where, like, where am I? Where am I? Like, what is this? <laughs> you know, in certain pages where I enjoyed that feeling because I always felt like the writer was in control of the, the sentence level. So kind of, you know, each piece was accumulating into something really interesting. So I trusted it. Um, and I'm just curious how you approach that. I know you have a good relationship with your editor, Cal Morgan. Um, is he kind of instructive uh, for you on the sentence level once you turn in a manuscript? I would love to just hear you talk about it. Yeah, sentences are fun because like they can do so many different things. And I, I think I, it's funny you mentioned like them visually as structures because I think like, I think it can sometimes be like sculpting. Like I think of a glass blower or something like the glass blower might be like, I'm going to blow a glass dog, but it doesn't know what the dog is going to look like. Or maybe it does, I don't know, you can't control the edge of a glass as you're blowing it, unless you're, I mean, maybe you can if you're really good at it, but maybe um, an experimental glass blower or something. Uh, but 
But uh, uh, one quote I've always thought of about when I think about sentences is William Ballman said, uh, he was talking about how, like he, he kind of is a, a obsessive reviser uh, and he, the way I am like, I'll, I'll, I'll probably, I've probably read, gone through Alice not from beginning to end on a sentence level 200 times in the past five years. Just like I, wow. I, I read from beginning to end, changing all the sentences I go and then I start over and save a new draft. So Volman said that he thought of revising sentences as like, um, uh, you keep fiddling with things and make, and changing things and making it more interesting until um, he thought thought of it as a popcorn kernel. And then when finally the sentence finishes, like the pop when a when a popcorn kernel bursts, it's covered with all these ridges and et edges that you can't like. If you look at one popcorn kernel, they're all different. So uh, and 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 he thought that by putting the the editing pressure on the sentence that way with language and doing weird things that suddenly to him it pops. And I think that I feel finally like maybe by the time I read through a manuscript and uh, partially it becomes with exhaustion where I just like, I do not want to look at this again. And if I do, I'm going to go nuts. Uh, yeah. There comes a point where you're like hurting it, I think. But to me, um, when I can finally read through the book as, as who I am at that day uh, and feel like I don't need to change anything, major i mean you can always twiddle with little things but like this is a fine sentence i might as well leave it alone <laughs> yeah <Right? laughs> yeah so would you say it's more instinctual than anything of just like it has to feel a certain way to you or do you have any do you have any certain uh you know things that you always do to a sentence if it's you know in a first draft form you'll always go in and take out a certain word or you overuse certain things i don't know I try to, I try to do the, uh, I mean, I see people doing that and they're like, I found that there were a hundred instances when I, when I said sometimes and I do, I'll like pick random words. I don't mm -hmm. do it. I'll just notice that's happening and, and kind of go through and, and play with them. But I think that repeat, repeating words and repeating things are also interesting parts of the voice. Like I notice when reading this book that there are constructions that feel like I don't use them normally, but they just kept showing up. And so normally I might say cut them, but in this case, it said, it, it seemed to, to be the voice of the book, book speaking again. I guess what I'm trying to do is like make it so it doesn't feel like me anymore. Um, Cause when I, mm -hmm. I like to write a, a, a first draft really fast and that feels like me. I think the point of writing a, a, a quick first draft is that you like speak from the unconscious and you kind of like create a portrait of yourself. Like I couldn't write this book now and I couldn't have written it five years before I wrote it, but like you are who you are while you're writing and that's an asset Like, uh, and you have to wield it while you can. So I guess that I almost like age out of the writing and I think like this is, I can't remember who wrote this. I don't know how, like every time I look at something I've written, I'm like, I have no idea who wrote this. And I think that's yeah. a good, that's my desired end point is to feel like um, I don't want to read my own writing. I want to read something that feels like someone else wrote it. Yeah. Or like, the sensation of like remembering a dream or something like who like who was that like that's my dream self that's not me or something that's how I think about a lot of my writing of just like it exists it, uh, often the first draft is written really quickly so it's like oh who was that person that was having that like fever dream like yeah, I don't well, recognize, I can't but almost in a way that helps me edit edit that that um kind of first draft you know mess but anyway yeah, well, I, it's, it, to me, it's like you, you, you write as a writer and then you edit as a reader. And so I, I, I like to think of it as if I didn't write it, you know, but like to edit as if you didn't write it, just editing your own writing a lot of the time, you know, it's like yeah. you look at it differently and you put different pressures on it. So, um, yeah. Yeah, you just beat it till it stops bleeding or something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think if most people edited their sentences 200 times, they would be really different books for people that don't do that. But I definitely relate to that kind of obsessive, you know, re, I don't know, just editing again and again. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I was curious about um, on the back cover of my copy. So I don't know if this was on the final copy, but on the advanced copy, it's um, described as unsettling and almost physically immersive. And I would definitely agree with this for Alice Knott. And so I won't spoil anything for those who haven't read the book, but I definitely felt more and more physically involved and implicated the longer the book went on. Um, again, to kind of go back to your, uh, just the power of the sentences, just kind of like taking me someplace different, um, every sentence, every page. And I was just curious what works of art, whether that be painting, film, music, other books um, that give you 
a similar immersive sensation. You know, if you can think of something that you, you mentioned, Isabella Hooper, I know that you're a fan of possession. Um, it's so maybe a movie like that, or just things that come to mind that maybe wouldn't be straightforward references for the book, but that you think about as being inspiring and immersive for you. Yeah, I think the, uh, it, I, I guess I can call a work of art the way my mom acted in the past, in the last couple of years of her life when she had dementia, walk, watching her walk around. Uh, so my mom lived my entire life in the same childhood house. And so, and as her brain kind of got destroyed, um, she stopped being able to recognize, like, I can remember one moment where she was standing at the mouth of the kitchen and there's like two ways to go. There's one way into the foyer and there's one way into the dining room that leads in the kitchen. She's looking at the refrigerator and wants to go to the refrigerator, but can't remember which direction it is. And I spent a lot of time around that, both with her and my father watching that. And I think like, I almost think that I started to think that they were seeing the world more purely than, than most people. Um, and, and, and I wanted to feel, I wanted that the nature of that texture of not only watching them, but imagine, not only imagining how it feels for them, but also watching them, watching it happen to them. So that's why I guess the book's written in mostly third person. Um, so it, it kind of goes back and forth between being stuck in that moment and being able to watch that moment, mm -hmm. um, which creates a weird tension with space, I guess. Um, so, I mean, that's... That's probably the main, I, and I didn't realize that was a main influence on space, but like the, the space of the book is definitely inherited from that. Um, yeah, other than that, like I, li I, I love a lot of films. Hannah Key would be big. Uh, uh, Isabel Huppert in The Piano Teacher is probably the, the way she looks in that in particular and the, uh, the way she moves in that, in that movie. Uh, I always, that's maybe the, my favorite ending of a movie ever where she just like comes out of the orchestra having just stabbed herself in the chest and just like turns and walks off screen and like then it, the camera sits with a blank with an empty shot and like there's so much power in that with almost nothing happening you know um yeah and so i guess it's uh sound i think of sound the the sound of a paragraph like a paragraph has a sound the shape of a paragraph has a sound white space has a sound sentences have sound the, looking at it visually so uh, yeah, I, I, sometimes I, I also edit where it's like I'm thinking of a computer screen, uh, well, like a coding browser, you know, um, more yeah. so than text. That actually fits in perfectly with a question that someone asked a couple minutes ago. So I'm going to bring this question in. So Nicholas is, asked, is saying, I just finished 300 million and loved it. You have spoken in articles about how it feels like the world is conspiring against our attention spans and how that makes it hard for readers to focus on books. One thing that I love about your books like 300 million is your interest in incorporating forms like computer code and film into your fiction. Would you consider this in some way to harness the power of these mediums into your language? And do you think this is somehow a gesture against the attack against our attention spans? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I always thought books would evolve more. I thought, I think um, I'm surprised that books haven't evolved more. I feel like books are still kind of behind. Like, I feel like there's been a lot of books and not a lot of progress. And a lot of that is because of media. Like, why isn't there, why aren't there being books designed that, I'm not going to ask that question. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, I think people are too rigid about the way they approach writing language. It's like, and, and I, I get this a lot. I think that, that people think that it, it, if something doesn't seem to fit, then it doesn't fit. And it's like, well, isn't that, more, aren't curiosities more interesting than, than particularities sometimes? Like, uh, I don't know, I, uh, I think about, uns, you know, I, Another space that would have influenced me is my grandmother's basement. I remember being in my grandmother's basement. She had a black floor and like these doors that would open into, there was a pantry full of trophies. And I always thought that there were more doors than I would ever be able to find. And I always kept looking for the doors and I would draw maps mm -hmm. of it and stuff. And it's like the ma that map of the room is more interesting than the room in some ways. And um, it connects my brain with space. So I think I'm always trying to like put things together that, that force connections that aren't just story and aren't just language so image is important and sound is important and 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 to me it's like it should be can you can you use language to make a multimedia experience without 
like I think people are boring thinking about multimedia books that are like basically movies on paper. It's like, yeah, start synesthesia and other sorts of things where you're not sure what's happening, but you can just feel it. Like to mm-hmm. me, books come from feel more than anything else. Yeah, yeah. Um, someone asked, what would you do if you weren't a writer? Do you have any answer to that? Oh, you could do just about anything. Um, uh, <laughs> well, what would I do if I weren't? I mean, I do, I don't think I am a writer. I just, <laughs> come on i mean after five books and you know i mean you write every day doesn't that make you a writer i mean mainly every day right yeah but i eat every day and i sleep (laughs) you're neither i don't know i yeah i i guess i have this weird thing about not being able to call myself what i am when it comes to that because i just oh i don't know i'd love to um I'd love to, uh, I don't know what I would do. I don't. I, I, and I hate when people say I only write because I can't, it's the only thing I can do. I, you can do anything you want. So like I chose to do this and I'm obsessed with doing it and I can't stop, I guess is the thing. So yeah. I'd, lo- I'd love to like go walk outside in nature for a while. I'd love to like uh, learn to like being uncomfortable in nature. Uh, I'd go camping and like not live in society or something. Yeah, I always think that um, that answer of like, I do it because I can't do anything else is just like a way of romanticizing yourself, you know? Yeah, <laughs> like, you can work a cash register. You, you can, can do something mop. else. You can do, you, you can, can do something else. High ropes. It also, yeah, you can. it also minimizes like the difficulty of doing anything creative. Like you can, it's really easy to do anything else, I think. But anyway, <laughs> it's true. I'll, I, I'll stop ranting. It's true. No, it's, I, yeah, I, I, I get you. And I, and I beat myself up a lot about, I, I, the last thing I like is like someone over proud of something that they did. Yeah, I but, get it. I get know, it. Whatever. Um, someone else is asking um, if you could name some current authors or books that are currently blowing your mind, things that um, are recent that you're into. Are you reading much lately? Uh, I have I have read less in the past four months than I ever have, and it's not by choice. I can't read more than two pages right now. I don't know if it's the pandemic thing or just like personal crap that's been happening to me. Or, but yeah, I just finished reading. Um, there's a anthology called "The Saddest Thing Is That I Have Had to Use Words" by Matt, that's a collection of writing by this woman, Madeline Ginz, that uh, was edited by Lucy Ives, and it is a. I've never seen anyone write the way this woman does, and. Um, she seems like she was a forgotten figure. At least, I mean, I'd never heard of her, but th- this this is an anthology of like one main book that she wrote that I can't remember the name of, but there's all this very uh, symbolist and like uh, there's math problems that explain how language and story works. And there's, uh, it's just all these multiple layers of ideas and th- that kind of like being able to ch- have a page that has like 15 ideas that I could think about forever feels better. Um, what else? I, I've gotten... What else was I reading? Well, I read Joel McSweeney's new collection, Toxicon and Arachne, and I think that's a really, I've always been a big fan of her, and I really love the poems in that. I'm, it's actually, I've, they're really hard, to, they're really intense poems, and they're, um, I'm still sort of reading it. I feel like right now it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to use this moment to slow down and read in a way that like, because I'm the kind of person that will read a book in two days and like, I can't remember what the book happened. What, <laughs> yeah. what was that? Um, yeah. Why is that? Why am I just stacking this list of crap I've read? I should like just spend all year reading one 30 or 80 page book if I can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Sam is asking if you have thoughts on balancing prose. So he means on the sentence by sentence level versus making sure it's grounding the reader in a scene and moving the story along. So I guess like language versus like storytelling, maybe Do you have a thought. Yeah, on that? I, I think I, I am I'm always mapping out. I'm always like, even though I don't know where I'm going and I'm writing, listening to sentences, I'm always kind of looking st- right ahead of where I'm going. So when writing a scene, I'll, I'll look to where I, what I want the scene to do. And maybe that you don't figure that out till you're halfway through the scene, or maybe you don't even figure it out till you finish the scene. But then I think I try to think syntactically or even in filmically about where I can come out, where I can take myself out and where I can put myself back in that's a jump. So like, um, I like the scenes to make a jump. Um, 
So, uh, and a lot of those scenes are idea driven. So, so maybe it's, it's reductive to say that it's all just language making things happen. I, I think once you write a scene, you're like, well, what would be interesting if it happened next? And what makes sense in this universe? And where can I go from here? So I'm always like connecting. It's almost like a, a switchboard or something like, let's try this and see which one shoots the most electricity through it. Uh, and sometimes you get it right a bunch of times in a row. And sometimes you write scenes that are garbage and sometimes you can't ever finish it. So yeah, trying to, trying to both look at where you're at and where you're trying to get in the next 10 pages and where you're trying to get in the next hundred pages. I think that's another reason that I like Frank, you mentioned frames and um, uh, constraints. And, 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 and yeah. one thing that's really helpful to me in that way is like, uh, well, like 300 million, I knew that I wanted it to have the same shape as uh, Roberto Bologna's 2666, even though it didn't have a lot of other similarities. It's like, I want it to have five books. I want them to be about the same length. So then I know while I'm pacing the scene, it's like, oh, I'm about this far through this section. I should start getting somewhere. And so it, maybe it becomes a question of momentum and pacing as much as it does like what a scene is. Mm hmm and does that come in later for you when you're reading it as a reader, like you said, because maybe the first draft, it's going too quickly to really assess the momentum? The ideal would be when you write the first draft to get a body. So like it has a beginning and, 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 and an arc and like maybe the arc is wavery at times and you have to straighten the arc out a little bit. But I think the ideal would be to like write in a, in a state of mind, in an emotional state of mind that that the book has an inherent body by the end, even if it's all messed up, it's like you at least know like some, it, 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 you're getting a shape, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, and then in revision, you're like, oh, I, uh, here's a point where something happens that I, it, it leaves a huge gap where it might be interesting to add another scene. And so then you can kind of re-tinker the arc and fit it and make it do more interesting things. But I think the first arc comes with the gut and then later the logic comes back in and is like, here's some opportunities you missed and here's some time where you were just pedal paddling your legs and you can cut that. Mm -hmm. uh, someone else is asking if you write longhand first and then type it or a little of both or only computer. I have the ch the handwriting of an eight year old. So I, <laughs> I cannot write by hand and take myself seriously at all. It's really, <laughs> I, I hate it. Uh, I've been trying to, lately because I do think like it feels different and it kind of feels more like immediately connected you, you don't have to deal with the machine but I don't know there's something about that maybe it's my coding background and my my just having been a computer sitter my whole life but like there's something like my voice won't come out the way I want it to unless I am typing and I mm -hmm. think that's because it's typing is so different than hand I mean language is felt so different when you have this you have this board with all these letters on it instead of like your mind is just squirting out like toothpaste so I like yeah. to have the board. I can type really quickly. So I find that it's actually, my writing is actually wilder if I'm typing, cause I can just, wow. I can almost like match my thinking. Whereas handwriting seems like it would be more, I don't know, like that it would be more pure somehow. I think there's like a romanticism around handwriting first, but for me, the computer is where I can actually access my thoughts as they're occurring. I don't know if that's I, the same I agree. You. I like that. I think that's true. The speed is important. And also like the ability to like, you know, you write three sentences and you're like, oh shit, let me go stick this sentence. Like I skipped a sentence. Let me insert a different sentence here. You can, I like being able to like pull things apart and like cut and paste and all that. And I think, I just don't think I could ever write all the sentences straight in a line. And maybe people have ways of writing down where they can do that too. But to me, it feels like a lot more organic, weirdly to use a computer. Yeah, it, it is strange in that way. Um, <laughs> Lorian is asking how your cover art came about. She's complimenting that she always likes your covers. Um, is there um, is there a story behind this this great cover? Oh, uh, hi, Lorian. Um, I no, that's all. That's all Riverhead. I didn't I didn't see it until it was done, and I was like, this is perfect. So uh, yeah, they um, forget the designer's name, but it's a house designer at Riverhead, and yeah, it's um. I think that the paint, the uh, the painter George Alt has a kind of story that oddly fits with the book too. Um, yeah, they did. They just did that, and they I guess they got the taste perfect. And I like the color. The colors remind me of Lynch, sort of, and that seems good. Um, yeah, it's a beautiful cover. I was happy that I I keep getting people to make nice things attached. So yeah, yeah. It. I've seen a lot of compliments on this cover, and I think it's a great fit too. So I think that's always great when the writer is happy is as happy as everyone else is. yeah <laughs> It'd be a tricky thing 
That's the worst when you don't like it. Yeah. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, Zach, we talked a little bit about structure uh, and form, so I'm going to skip that one. Um, Caitlin is asking, what movie scene has punched you hardest in the guts? We talked a little bit about film. Do you have anything that we didn't go over that you want to say, a specific scene? Yeah, I I weirdly think immediately of, uh, it just came out in a, in a, a restored format. Uh, Scott McClanahan uh, told me to watch, sent me this movie in the mail, said I had to watch it, and it's called Come and See. Criterion just released a, a restored version of it. It's a, um, it's a World War II movie told from uh, the Russian side. And there's a scene, it's, a very, it's got Tarkovsky camera movements. He was a, L.M. Klamov was like a person that uh, was nearby with Tarkovsky. So he's got a lot of Tarkovsky camera movements, but there's this scene that this kid and this girl are running from the military. Um, and he's trying to go back to his childhood home to find he he enlists and he uh the everything gets fucked and he goes back to his house um and his parent his fam he his family isn't there and there's a shot where they're running down this down this dirt road and they run past his house and they don't see this pile of bodies against their house it's like an insane pile of bodies and they end up running and you see it and you see them running past and it's like this long tracking shot that where they then end up like neck deep in mud in the swamp and it's a really long tracking shot and it's got that weird tension of like i feel like ambient space um in in movies where it's almost like you feel like if you could control the camera you could go anywhere in the scene um but mm -hmm. they have focusing on those characters for whatever reason Does, if that makes sense like yeah concrete ambient space that feels it's almost like being on drugs where the world looks uh like in like a vacuum took all the air out and it's just like frozen like this like um yeah, yeah that everyone should watch come and see that's great um i think i misspoke earlier sorry there's a bunch of questions in our in this thing i think i misspoke that um i was going to say to kyle that he attended late we talked about form and structure so i'm skipping that question but zach asked um that you said you write nearly a hundred drafts of that you wrote nearly a hundred drafts of this book how much did the book change between drafts one to 50 versus how much did it change from drafts 51 to 100. So at what point was the structure set so that you could focus on the sentence revision that you're talking about? So sorry, Zach, I didn't mean to overlook that question. I think it's an interesting one. That's a tough one just to answer. I mean, I guess in the, la the later versions are a lot of just sentence, hopefully I have the scenes down by then, but even then I could imagine like, um, I know I added scenes even very late where it seemed like there was always something missing. And a lot of that did help. Uh, Cal Morgan, my editor is really good at like being like this over here is like, what's up with this? And like, kind of, uh, you know, you can kind of find those places where it's like, something's missing here. I don't know what it is. And sometimes it takes a bunch of times to figure that out. But yeah, I mean, in the end, it's just kind of like changing little, little insane things that don't need to be changed or do need to be changed and just trying to make the language fit better. But yeah, I'm I I always I'm always willing to like add paragraphs and remove par paragraphs and like um, I don't know I ch even in the, the from galley to the final I changed a whole lot of different things of uh, detail oriented just to get like certain details right like there's a there's an art uh, a woman who makes a uh, a remake of in the original version she makes a remake of the movie a one woman remake of the movie speed and in this and then for some reason i changed it to rambo between the galley and the thing <laughs> it just seemed funnier to be rambo or something but like i don't know things like that it's like something seems off right here let me tweak it but yeah a lot of it's just line editing over and over again and and yeah because uh, there are a lot of super complicated sentences that could be they could actually probably be edited lots of different ways i think that like playing with the rules in that way allows you to like, am I breaking this rule on purpose for this way to do something important or is it just like not correct yet? Um, mm -hmm. So sometimes it looks like mistakes, but they're intentionally incorrect or something. I don't know. So I'm always finagling all different, all the different aspects, but the language is probably the last 50 drafts more. Yeah. Um, I'm going to combine two of the questions. Someone asked, um, is there any discussion about your previous titles being re-released ever? Is it weird to see your work like Scorch Atlas for sale used on Amazon for hundreds of dollars? 
And then someone's asking if you think indie publishing is going to be in a better or worse place than five, 10 years ago. Or I guess they're asking about it now. Do, the, do you, your thoughts on indie publishing and then also your old work kind of appearing for hundreds of dollars? Any thoughts on those <laughs> things? I think that always happens on Amazon. It seems like any book on Amazon that only has one copy, the, 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 the person tries to charge like a whole bunch of money. So I don't, yeah, as far as, as far as reprinting is concerned, I don't even, I don't even know which ones are out of print or not. Uh, maybe they'll be reprinted, uh, but they're, they all, you can still get them from use there. They, there's enough copies of that, <laughs> but I yeah. I'd be, I'd be more than fine to do something with them. But um, uh yeah, indie publishing is great right now. I think there's tons of great presses doing amazing things. There's so many people making amazing things. Uh, it's hard to keep up with, really. It's I mean, I, I, I say that the that books haven't progressed a lot, but I mean, really, that there's so much happening on the small press circuit, and that's always been my main place of reading. Um, and I also think that they are going to have to carry more of the weight. I think like it's it, we'll see what happens with the economy in the world, but like it seems harder and harder to wrangle things. So, I mean, I've always kind of been attracted to presses run by one person that was just like fully their taste and fully their ideas. And I don't know, I also have friends who have just like been like, ah, I wrote this book, I designed it and I'm going to print out, I, I'm selling pre-orders. And if 200 people buy it, that's how many copies will exist. And then I'm on to the next one. And it's like, you know, 200 copies is plenty for, of something to exist in the world. I mean, sure, everyone would like to sell more than 200 copies, but like, I'd rather be, in, I'm more interested in like getting to do what I want to do. Um, so if I can keep, I, I'm, I'm, I've been thrilled with where I've gotten to do things and, 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 and with Cal being huge in my life in that way, but like, um, I don't take it for granted. And I, and I think that like anything can happen. So, um, I don't know. I think, I think that I'm, po I'm positive on, on small, small press publishing's future. It seems like, and, 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 and I think that self-publishing might be really important in the future for like things that couldn't exist elsewhere. Cause I mean, there's so much of a process for books to get through these walls. And I, I see my friends that like submitting books that I know are amazing and seeing them get rejected. And I'm like, that doesn't, all you need is one person who believes and has the power to put it out. And, and then it has a life of its own. So yeah, uh, that's a long road sometimes, but. Yeah, and as it becomes more accessible to make small quantities of books, I mean, it's really easy. It's like, kind of, if you want to do that and you think there's an audience for it, I mean, anyone can do it now. So I think yeah. that that's really kind of amazing in a way. So I think that, I'm, I know they didn't ask for my opinion, but I personally think that we will we will see like things change in the next couple of years too. I think people will become more kind of bold with releasing their own work. Yeah, I also think I also think I would like to say that like there are different books for different places. Like this Alice not belonged with Riverhead to me and it, and it's, and, it, and, and it made sense there. And, and at the same time, I've written several books since then that I don't know who ever the hell would have published them. Cause they're quite far out there. And like, I probably will self self publish a book at some point just because I don't want anyone have to deal with that. But me, <laughs> you know, so I think it's a burden. <laughs> yeah. It's like, this is, this is only for like four people if that, you know, but this one I, uh, I felt had a bigger audience, but yeah, I mean like there will be purposes. All presses have can have different purposes and like uh, major publishing does brilliant things in its way. And, um, and there's a lot of noise there, but you know, there's a lot of noise on small press publishing too. It's just a matter of finding the right place for the right thing. Yeah. Um, Ryan is asking, uh, he says that, I think you, I read you originally wanted to create video games. If you were enlisted by a video game company to write and create a video game today, what would it look like? Hmm. Hmm. What would I, I think I would no longer write a video game. I would write a text-based role-playing game. That was what I was really writing early on. I was I, 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 I like to program text-based role-playing games. I, I, I made one that was like, <laughs> I, I don't need to tell that story. Um, <laughs> well, I will. Uh, so I no, that's not what I'd write. I don't know. I think I I could I like I actually finished a science fiction novel that is a that is software, um, or at least a section of it is software. I think you could write software on paper and have it be not compilable and it wouldn't run on a computer but it could still operate like software uh so I'll, i still i i don't need to fuck with video games like someone else can do that that's i if i could if i could just like shit a, a 
30,000 ideas onto a piece of paper and turn and like magically turn into a video game. I would do that. I would want it to be yeah. in, in uncontrolled. That movie, not movie, that game, um, what was that band game where I'm saying so many things I don't want to say. Um, <laughs> I don't know what I would do. I would just, I would make it chaos. I would make a chaos game that had many, yeah. many thousands of storylines, I guess. Maybe something with the doors, the map, like you were talking about. A map is always good. Yeah. Um, I think we're running out of time. So I'm really sorry we're not getting to everyone's questions. So there was a lot of enthusiasm in the Q&A. Um, we appreciate it. But I think we're going to close out. I have one more question for you, Blake. Um, there's a part in Alice Not when a musician is interviewed and says, art is forever, bro. Your kid is going to die one day. So am I too. The difference is I've written codes that millions of Americans had sung into their heads in repetition for years and years to the point they can sing it without hearing. My question to you is, do you think art is forever or should it be forever? Jeez, Chelsea. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. is, there, is, there a is there a beauty in impermanence or is yeah. permanence the point of art? I think that's what your book kind of made me, made me wonder. So I don't know if there's an answer to that, but that is kind of how I wanted to, that's what I wanted to ask you. That's a great, that's a great <laughs> question. I, ha, I, I hold both at the same time. Um, I think that, I mean, I've had things happen to me lately where I think that like, I've been told that art does have more of a purpose for life than we even realize. And I can get that like um, humans create things. I think each human is capable of creating something that no one else that has ever existed is capable of creating, which to me feels like a, code or a key or a secret that they carry and therefore uh, we don't know what's going to become of that thing but I think it, those unique objects are uh, are important I also am the kind of person that would say like it's fine that it only existed for half a second and was destroyed and it's more to be more beautiful that way like the you know or it's funny like funny things can happen to art like that that those that woman that tried to restore the Jesus painting and turned it into this <laughs> terrible uh, I mean terribly nightmarish thing that actually seems more beautiful than Jesus to me uh like that's good and then you could take that and throw it in the the woods and let it rot and then come back and get it like I don't know like yeah it's both it's uh, it feels to me similar to the Jungian idea that gibberish and and religious speech are side by side and that the highest speech is right next to gibberish um mm -hmm. um both are true yeah yeah I think we'll, we should end it there. I think that's great. I really thank you for writing a book that prompts so many questions. And um, yeah, I see Chris here. So I'll let him close it out. Thank you, Blake. Thank you. Yep. So much. Thank you so much. It was awesome. Uh, piano teacher, best movie. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, lo love to hear about that. Uh, anyway, th thank you so much for, to both Blake and Chelsea. Uh, thank you to everyone who asked questions. Uh, sorry, we couldn't get to everybody. If you missed any of the event, it'll be on YouTube soon. And uh, please buy the book if you haven't already. Uh, we have the link on the event page and in the chat. Uh, every book helps us put on more free events, and uh, it'll be 10% off for a limited time. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, thank you, everyone. Thanks for the powerhouse, all of you. Bye-bye.